welcome to our monthly meeting. I'm Joni, I'm the board president of By the Dollar Year. Um, we have a great lineup tonight. Um, we have first Lynn Bobbitt, who is the exec executive director of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. And she will discuss the new master plan for Brackenridge. to go first, and then we have two uh, gentlemen from in the back that are from uh, the appraisal district, and they're going to uh, talk to us about uh, the appeal process and answer any questions you may have about um, your property taxes. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Excuse me. Now we'll do that. Following the press, March 2nd, the City Council adopted three strategies uh, to uh, now the next step is to move forward with them. But let me back up for those of you who did not follow the process, or am I telling you anything you know? Is everybody in? Go ahead. Remind you. Okay. Um, in April 2015, the mayor requested $227,000 to update the 1979 master plan and that was the only master plan for the park that had been adopted by city council and uh, the uh, city council at that time it was uh, moved forward by the parks and recreation department parks and recreation department uh, recommended four architects Alamo architects rialto uh, jay allen Jim Gray of Rialto Studios is the lead on the development plan. And at that time, the City Council had only allowed for two public meetings. The Conservancy became involved um, at the same time that all of the citizens did. And we were pleased that the Council opened it up to additional conversation. We agreed too that there needed to be more input from the community. Uh, before things move forward. So there were a total of eight public meetings and then five activity-based events in the park. One was here, actually. Uh, one was a movie as it, at Sunken Garden, and another was an archaeological dig. So there were five different activities that would identify certain important parts of the park. And so after all of that conversation, the three strategies that were adopted included the restoration of historic structures and features, the restoration of the natural areas, our heritage trees, taking out invasives, and improving water quality. And then the third was the connection, and you play a big part in that, to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, San Antonio is rated 71 out of 100 by the uh, Trust for Public Lands on cities that have open space or parks within a 10 minute walk. Now that will change a bit in 2017 when they get the report because of Pearsall Park that has come on board. Uh, there is more acreage. So uh, it's important, and you all know this, I'm speaking to the choir here about the importance of Brackenridge Park used by everybody in this city, from all districts of the city, not just District 1 and District 2. So we were very pleased that the City Council would move forward with a portion of the plan. Many people were concerned about the circulation discussion and preventing traffic and access into the park that is off the table. Um, also, uh, the uh, use of a trolley system from a garage uh, that has been taken off the table. And so the three things that were adopted was what the community came together with for common ground. Now, in some of those meetings, probably most of them, many people stood up and said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I began giving tours, and I'm doing so regularly every few days. If anybody would like a tour of the park, I'm happy to do that, or I'm happy for you all to gather as a group uh, in the Market Park Association in the park. Because uh, it is critical that we take action now. And so go bond. It passed. There was $21.5 million allocated for the park. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that. 
Uh, you see these pretty pictures, and you do think, oh, well, what, what, what does it mean? Um, but um, this was interesting. We held a summit on March 3rd. Some of you may have come. It was held at Pearl. It was open to the public. The Conservancy sponsored it in conjunction with the Cultural Landscape Foundation out of uh, D.C. And we had been working with a consultant there, CEO Charles Birnbaum. And when we showed him around, he said, this part needs to be raised to national discussion. Number one, if we do that, there is a way to get national funding foundation and corporation. Um, at this time, we're not able to apply to certain foundations because we are not designating the National Historic Landmark and one of the goals that we want to continue. Um, but out of this meeting, I thought this was an interesting, <coughs> you can read this. There are parks that are just green spaces, and then there's a class of parks that soar above the commonplace. This is a place that represents the generosity of spirit of time and civic mindedness, mindedness was a virtue to be aspired to. But I can see the frayed edges, records of the unfortunate decisions and muddled priorities that hollow the park today. It's like a beloved, vital, and sentient elder relative prematurely lodged in a nursing home. It needs love and release from the expedient care it's gotten. And this was the gentleman that came from L.A., toured the park on his own. He's from Olin Partners in L.A. Uh, and so he noticed the cultural aspects of the park that all of us know about and want to maintain in terms of traditions, make uh, those things that are important to all segments of the community still a part of the park, but then find ways to make improvements and enhancements that, that, that maintain all the things that are important to us. Um, I don't know if you know, but we have 2.2 miles of the river that runs through the park, and then our Catalpa uh, Persian ditch is 1.3, so that it lines the outside of the park and does create a barrier and something that uh, is within the plan to discuss too for the future. Um, the, what, what has also been talked about is out of the 343 acres, which includes the golf course, the first tee, the driving range, the witty, and uh, the zoo, there are only 113, 115 acres that are open and free to the public. That means the open space. So the zoo, the witty, they're doing amazing things. They have different missions. The witty has met their um, need for exhibit space and uh, revenue generating May Center. And so what the Conservancy is concentrating on now is the open space and the green space and how to uh, revitalize it and to not just make um, uh, uh, you feel like you need to go to the Witty and then get in your car and then drive to the zoo, but how do you connect the, all of the partners, all of the stakeholders, and make a day in the park that you want to be in the park and enjoying it? I spent the night Easter, um, and uh, it's quite an experience. Everybody was really very nice, but I had friends come, we barbecued, and um, we're, we're getting there in terms of picking up trash 100% better than it was last year. Um, but the more I'm there in the office every day, meeting people, seeing what people are like, what they need, uh, we're all learning. So it's a way of, of all of us, including the Conservancy, uh, keeping our minds open and thinking. Uh, the master plan, the three strategies were adopted, that's only the beginning. This is going to be a long, deliberate process with lots of continued input. Um, <coughs> we were talking about the Blue Hole earlier. Are all of you familiar with the headwaters of the river, which are located on their Incarnate Word property? And at the top, the Blue Hole. They have been flowing since November, but now they're dried up, meaning they're not coming out of the walls. <laughs> it's spewing out. Um, and so it's about 520 yards from the Blue Hole um, over to the park. And we just met with uh, Sister Yolanda, the uh, Sisters of Charity, um, opening up that dialogue about how we might connect under Hildebrand to the Blue Hole so that we can discuss the not, not only the interpretive connection, but the physical connection of the spiritual reach that they are so interested in and are taking good care of all the way 13 miles on out to the missions. Uh, we are connected by the river. The history of the city is encapsulated within the park. Uh, human habitation goes back 11,000 years. And 
and uh, then moves on through the Spanish colonial period and Civil War period up to modern times. And what has perhaps served as well is that not a lot has been done. So the cultural underpinnings are still there. Um, this really, we, we, as we have begun our conversations with people from throughout the United States who've come to visit, they are just amazed at the cultural um, landscape that is there. And so we've begun thinking of it as a landscape. <coughs> How then do we make decisions based on what is there and not destroy what is there, but yet maybe bring additional activity improvements into the park? This was, uh, this uh, orange area represents the first 199 acres of the park, which Colonel Brackenridge donated in 19 and 1899. Um, he then donated another section over where the polo field used to be. But this shows you the connection to the uh, water work system, which was up at the Botanical, where, where you all are. Um, and it, we, this was just for me so that I could see some different dates that everything became part of the park. I'm just going to go through some of these real quickly. The park opened in 1901, and as I just mentioned, the 1979 master plan was the first one, but in 1997 they tried to uh, create another plan and that did not happen. But are you aware that in 2005, Miraflores, which is right here, this is Hildebrand and Broadway, this is sometimes referred to as a cemetery, but it's not. It was created as a sculpture garden by Dr. Duridio, who came here in 1914. But in 2005, there uh, was activity with uh, Incarnate Word, and um, Mayor Cockle, at that time, left the city and became CEO, CEO of the uh, Parks Foundation, which is the foundation, as you know, raises money, raises money for parks throughout the city. And Incarnate Word wanted to use the property uh, for perhaps parking and other things, and so the city a switch and so the land at the top of Hildebrand and Stadium where the bike pharmacy school is now uh, was switched out from Mira Flores and we kind of were also dedicated to mitigation monies which helped with the restoration of the wall and then the park the Mira Flores became part of the park. Um, it's four acres now. It's not open to the public right yet but within the next few weeks a walkway is going to go from the bridge just below um, the Hill Grand entrance and um, go into the park and over to the, to, the, to the gates that you see here on Hildebrand so that we can begin giving guided tours. <coughs> Y'all have any questions about me if you do? Um, here are the strategies that were adopted. Uh, restore and improve the natural features, preserve and restore the cultural and historic features and increase the park visibility. The last two were reduced. Um, we used the wrong word for Grand Lawn. The service parking lot by the train depot, the conversation that the architects put forward was, if we build a parking garage over by the zoo, can we begin reclaiming some of the asphalt in the park and turn it green? Uh, it did not mean that it was going to be something that was only uh, sun and nobody would be able to use. Trees could be planted, a pavilion, whatever. But this is now off the table for now. Uh, there are 200 feet of river frontage along there that you really can't even get down to. So at some point, maybe that surface lot becomes multi-purpose with pervious cover. But right now, that's not under discussion. Um, we've been doing research about what other conservancies and other parks are doing. And if you look at this slide, the number of acres of free space is 113, but probably uh, 20 acres of that maybe is asphalt and not green space. And um, estimated annual maintenance should be about 282,000. That's a drop in the bucket. And then current best park practices for spending per acre should be 20,000. So you see what we actually do, 282,000, we are way below what needs to be done. And so throughout the United States, conservancies are coming, uh, are developing and forming partnerships with the cities. 
so that um, we, the private end, can raise additional funds for the parks to do the maintenance that the cities cannot keep up with. There is no endowment fund for the park. Uh, even the pavilions, the Joski Pavilion, the Kale Pavilion, the Cypress Pavilion, even though those rentals are minimal, what is raised by them go back into the city's general fund, not even into the park's budget. And so uh, we are beginning conversations with the city about what kind of revenue generation could be created to form an endowment for maintenance that could supplement what they are getting out of the general fund every year for the budget. There are over 24,000 acres of parks in the city. This Bracken Ridge is only considered one of the parks in the city. So, you know, I'm exaggerating this, but if you want a light bulb, you get in line. <laughs> you know, um, it isn't that there is a dedicated force to Bracken Ridge. It's just one of the parks in the city. But of course, I think of it differently. It is our second oldest park in the city. But I do feel like there's wind in our sails. Uh, but this is the final section of the San Antonio River to be uh, uh, improved. You have the Mission Reach, you have the Museum Reach, and now you have the Park Reach. And so we've begun conversations with the San Antonio River Authority since the master plan was adopted about how to improve the water quality. Somebody, uh, yes, you were saying uh, swimming in the river. That is not allowed now, but you do see people doing it. But there, there is an E. coli from the E. Red Rookery that is there on, near Lambert Beach. I, if you all are walking, you should go see them because they're there, they're now, and the babies are hatching, and uh, quite a few of them. And the buzzards, the buzzards are there. I don't remember they came last year, and they. They like us. They're, they're there every morning pulling the trash out. Um, I toured with the, the assistant city manager one day, and she was absolutely horrified. And we got some new trash cans, but they still had a hole in them. And so, you know, they pull them out. So that's something we're going to work on, too. But the bond proposal for uh, parks was Proposition 3 of $21.5 million. This is the largest amount that's been dedicated to parking in, in, uh, since we've been doing these recent bond issues. Um, 7.75 million is, is allotted toward the repair and restoration of the Depression Era river walls. And you can see over by Lambert Beach uh, the deterioration, and you see wood frames holding up the wall, and they're actually concerned that that big, beautiful tree is going to fall in the river. That is not construction that's begun. I started work in April 2017, and it's been that way ever since. Um, so that will be one of the first projects. And then you come on around the bend to the 1877 pump house uh, that uh, was the, the pre precursor to the San Antonio water system. And uh, it will be stabilized, the foundation and the roof and, um, and uh, repointing and new window frames. It's the oldest industrial, intact industrial building in San Antonio. Um, then you come on further toward the entrance as you come from Broadway to Hildebrand into the park, and you have the 1877 Upper Labor Dam and the Sakia. Uh, and would you believe it was started on July 4th, 1776? The Spaniards have meticulous records. It was finished two years later in 1778. And we have requested that it be designated a tricentennial project. Um, and so we received that, and what does that mean? No money. But uh, the goal, <laughs> the, the, we're looking, uh, but the goal is to uncover the dam. Uh, UTSA has done the archaeology over a period of years, but it's been covered back over to protect it. You can uh, look down and see from modern times all the way down to the Spanish colonial rubble wall down below. Um, the acequia is there exposed um, and um, up to about 600 feet of it all together running toward the zoo. Yes? And when we saw that, people can go and see that part. I guess it makes an air conditioning work. It is right here. Mm -hmm. It's right about here. So if you turn into the park, on Hill, you know, Hildebrand, into the park, come here. It's all right up here before you cross into Mirror Forest. It's, well, it's on the park side. Right. 
And so uh, it was not a, a Nisekina Dam for the missions. It was built to accommodate the Canary Islanders and the population increased from 1731 to <coughs> 1776 period. There needed to be more water for agriculture and raising and household use. So the, the Asapia and the dam on the Witte property that they have interpreted uh, was 1719 and that did supply the water for Sancho um, de Bolero. So we can tell the whole story, the mission era as well then as the city development. It's really very cool. And then along with uh, that development will be interpretation of, of the whole ball of wax essentially. Um, when I, this is Mira Flores Gates on Hildebrand. And part of the mitigation money that I was talking about paid for redoing the gates themselves and the walls that go along Hildebrand. The lights have just been repaired. Um, and so uh, uh, we're talking about what the possibilities are for it. Here you see the Upper Labor Dam area, just as you turn in. Um, the AT&T property over to the right. This parking lot here backs up to Mira Flores. If you come in this way to AT&T, you'll notice this surface lot that backs up. AT&T sold that to Mr. Huddleston, who owns the boardwalk. Um, and there is conversation. He's talking about putting apartments here. Um, I spoke with Joni. We have heard that AT&T um, uh, is going to rezone the property. I have not been called. Um, I haven't heard recently. Um, um, and the building will not be torn down because it's listed now within the historic, um, uh, it has a historic designation. Um, so we're monitoring that. But let me know whatever you do. <laughs> I, I heard from the Lord three, two, three months ago that they were kind of in a pause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just rezoning, uh, you know, I'd like to hear what some of you have to say. But, you know, that is not bad. I mean, if it's going to be multi-use housing, retail, office, um, but we need access into the park there. So, and we're concerned, of course, the, the height, whatever is going to happen close to the river. Um, this is an aerial of what's left of Mira Flores. Um, the, uh, so much has been damaged since 19, uh, I mean, since 2007. Um, it's, it's not secure, really. I mean, it has a fence around it, but yesterday I was over there and just watched people crawl over and walk across. Um, so the plan that was done in 2007 was to restore it to its full glory. It was sculptured by the very lush, redo most of the sculptures that were there. But um, we are reopening that conversation now to see just what is feasible and what is realistic. So perhaps this is interpreted and it is left to be uh, a meditative uh, pleasure garden where you can walk and picnic and learn about uh, not only Spanish but Mexican, Tejano, and American culture. Uh, Dr. Urrutia fled here in 1914 during the Mexican Revolution and um, he brought his family here and acquired the property where the Intercontinental uh, building is now, the old VW site uh, at Funston and Broadway. Uh, that incarnate word is leasing and putting buses there. <laughs> but um, uh, that was an O'Neill Ford building, and I don't know how we lost our furious house, but um, he, the, the property near Flores he bought a little bit later after he built his house. And so the heyday here was like 1920 to 1930s, but it was not connected to that property at Funston. And um, this is the location where many of the Fogwad or Bajo Rustico that uh, are, were located. Some of that has been destroyed. There's a Palapa that's been redone. But um, there, there are some other significant pieces that are still there that Dionisio Rodriguez did, uh, as well as in the park. So we have pieces stored at the San Antonio Conservation Site warehouse waiting to see what we can do. I got the first grant of 15000 from uh, a family who originally came from Mexico who want to redo one of the pieces of sculpture, but we, we can't do it until we actually have a plan and it's protected. This is um, 
a reflection of what it could be, the idea of the trees. When you drove in, I brought some old historic photos of parks that I'll pass around too if y'all are interested. But you know, the trees met in the middle when you drove through that day. It was very lush. You'd see Dr. Derudia's statue that's there, and that was sort of like a meditation room with bushes and trees and plantings around it. Um, but it would be wonder. This is a, a pavilion that uh, AT&T built, uh, the Pioneer uh, Retirement Organization picnic there, and they built huge barbecue pits there that uh, we're going to see if they work. <laughs> um, this is an aerial of uh, the Sunken Garden Theater. We just had our, our special annual Spirit of Breckenridge Friday night, and we held it at Sunken Garden. And we, uh, Jason Davey, the, uh, our celebrity chef, uh, served dinner, created dinner. We served it on the theater itself. And so what we've been trying to do each year is uh, highlight a certain area of the park that many people are not aware <coughs> of or remember it from childhood days. And uh, theater is such a jewel. The, the, it was originally built in 1930, and then the dressing, room, the dressing rooms were added in 1936. Uh, there is no amphitheater in this region, the one on 35, right near New Braunfels, Horizon closed. This uh, is, uh, could seat to, up to 5,000. There is not that category of theater here now, especially indoor or outdoor, since uh, the municipal auditorium was transformed. Uh, Majestic holds 25. So, um, you know, the, the, the goal Friday night was to say, look at this jewel. Um, it needs our loving care, and um, perhaps this is the next major bond request in 2022. <coughs> there you see. I mean, you know, the opera opened in 1930, but the symphony played there on a regular basis. Uh, there were all kinds of performers. Dylan Santana, you know, they had Pirates of Penzance on the stage. Uh, some of you may have attended. Um, and so this is an idea of showing what might could happen. That is not proposed. That is just... Okay, this is the pump house. Um, this is on the Lambert Beach side. Um, it is the 1877 building. It was built uh, not by Mr. Brackenridge, but by a gentleman named Mr. Lacoste. Uh, there was no public water delivery at that time. Uh, Mr. Brackenridge was his banker. And so eventually he acquired the, the business in 1883. Pumped the water up to where the botanical was, and the two reservoirs there, and then it of course came down with gravity. Uh, uh, this, uh, at this time, has no proposed use. It's been empty for a long time. Uh, to the left are the bathhouses. You need to take time to walk back behind there and peek in and look at the uh, Spanish colonial um, Decor, you know, they have the, the, the thing that looks like the Alamo parapet. It, it looks like a longhouse if you look all the way through it. And so, what could what could we all enjoy there? There really is not a restaurant on that side of the river either. And the the water came out that hole. Those that it flowed out into the river, and that's where the turbines were. And at first, it was um, artesian. Uh, was springs, and then he dug a well, and it was artesian. And do all of you know that the water in the river now is the gray water, it's the recycled water? Um, you see those purple pipes with the yellow on them throughout? Well, right by the Woody, uh, there's a pipe that puts water in on a regular basis throughout the day to keep the level at a certain height. Um, and there's one well in the park that is not capped that goes into the Edwards, and that was left in case something happened. And I laugh because, you know, we say if there's a convention coming to town and you need water in the river walk downtown, then you can turn, open up this well and fill it up. Um, so one of the problems with the water quality is that this is the gray water. It's treated. They don't want swimming, but the idea of perhaps putting the paddle boats back, I grew up with paddle boats. Some of you may remember there was the speedboat on the river. Well, I'm not proposing that the speedboat come back, but it would be great to have the paddle boat activity and go at Lambert Beach over to the zoo. Um, so, you know, we're talking to the River Authority about aerating and what would that mean, how much would that cost, uh, but there is the conundrum about the, the egret rookery, and 
nobody's proposing moving them, but what do we do? They really do make a mess. This is the inside. It's just one big room, but that's the original ceiling. Beautiful wooden planks. And this is the view you would see from inside. You know, if you're looking down the river, you're, you're looking uh, east. Is it large enough for a bin? It could be, but with the bathhouses together, and there's a little patio area over behind that, and the, if you notice, even across there, let me see, there is the old restroom that is right about here, one of these, that is used for storage. It's in 1920s, there were two twins. There one right there by the Lambert uh, softball field that is still restrooms, and then this one is just storage. So if you had those three buildings to have some function there, I think it would serve the park well. Um, one of the items that the consultant, Charles Birnbaum, recommended to us after he saw the park, and I alluded to this in the beginning, is to pursue a National Historic Landmark designation and or a National Heritage Area. And in, in the beginning, I thought we needed the National Landmark before we went on to National you know, Heritage Area, but that's not the case, I've learned. Right now, the whole park is on the National Register of Historic Places. That doesn't prevent particular uses, but it does, if you're going to use federal money, you would have to go through a 106 review and be approved. But anything within the park now has to go to the Texas Historic Commission already, as well as to our review board. Um, and so everybody dealing with the park is aware of that. The good thing about the National Heritage Area is that um, there is not, there's not one in Texas. We could be the first. I understand it's very political. Uh, it would take something lengthy in terms of process, like creating the World uh, Heritage uh, Mission site. Um, but there is no heritage area in the city, and there are only maybe 30, 37 national heritage uh, areas that have World Heritage Sites within the district. And this would all be tied together by the river, the river running through it and connecting us all. And so it would be uh, a necessity to form a steering committee with all of the very, you know, business interests, mission, National Park Service, you all, neighborhoods, uh, to start that process. And we were told that the Getty Foundation is one of the major foundations that does fund the National Heritage Area Development and uh, National Heritage Landmarks. Um, this is the dam. As you come in from Hildebrand, do you look down and you notice that pond? Mm -hmm. uh, it's lost so much water just in the last week. Uh, but that holds the water, the dam backed it up. It was a diversion dam, not an impounding dam. And so it diverted the water into the lily pond and then into the acequia and then out into the fields. Um, part of that acequia goes into the zoo and they've actually incorporated that into their exhibits. And then it crosses St. Mary's, goes into River Road and it makes its way on down to San Pedro. Um, so it would be, um, an opportunity to interpret not and uh, once the dam was exposed how do we protect it but at the same time interpret it and have a walkway down to it that's why you have to come and be there so i can show you all this um, here's the acequia exposed only part of the dam uh, you can see here but there's the lily pond and then hildebrand would be right here and then this pathway over here, that's actually sitting pretty much on the dam. So all along here is where the dam is. And there was a Civil War tannery that came um, <coughs> right before the war and continued during the Civil War years. And they then put their stamp on the acequia. And you can see the pretty cut stone and know that it's a different period than the rubble stone down below that smashed by now. Um, and and then, uh, when the Civil War was over, they sold it back to the federal government. There you see part of the dam. On the top are the, 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 more, uh, the Civil War period stones. And then you go on down, you can see the rubble. 
and UTSA has just completed their report. Actually, you can get on their website and it's just up and it talks about what they have found and, and uh, the various relationships of the Asakias and Bands. And then we'll end with the propositions. Um, it took you know, a year working with city uh, managers, city council, the various bond committees. Some of you may have been on the bond committees. I learned a lot. It was my first bond process. And um, it seems like all of them, uh, all of the propositions are going to uh, affect different parts of every district. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting um, opportunity for San Antonio. And we're so excited about what can happen in the park. The 7.75 million I mentioned is for the capital infrastructure. It's not frills. It <coughs> When you come and take a tour, you'll see it is deterioration. It's something that we've got to do now, or we're going to lose the pump house, we're going to lose the wall, or it's going to cost us more as we go down the line. The 11.5 million is for the parking garage of about 600 cars on Tulita, just up the hill from the zoo. And it's on San Antonio Independent School District property. And the zoo has a memorandum of understanding to uh, build the garage. Um, and so it'll probably be a three-way. We were meeting with the city manager's office today to get an update since the bond passed. And so uh, it, it will be free to the public. Uh, for special events, there probably will be a charge, but um, coming to the park, coming to the zoo, um, there will be no charge. There will be a connection from the top of the garage to uh, walk over to Sunken Garden and then make your way down over to the theater. And one of the assets now is when this is built to accommodate traffic at night for <coughs> the theater. Uh, we're going to have to be creative because there really is not enough space for huge garages throughout the park. And do we really want to use that more open space for garages within the perimeter of the park? But this is the beginning. And um, then there will be two more floors added to the garage on Avenue B that the Witty operates and maintains. And so there will be no more footprint of land taken. It will go on the top of that garage. And, and, and so you will have additional uh, parking. And that's needed too. So um, it's an exciting time. Come you see me. OK, you guys ready? So we have um, Chief Appraiser Michael Mes. Mesquita. 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 No, I want to come see you too. I will see you. We have a special manager, Tom Allen. So um, they're going to talk to us about our taxes and real process. I want to touch base with y'all about something. Tom is going to speak to y'all specifically about the property values. I want to talk to you about something a little bit more global. We're coming to the end of the session. Uh, it's about time for us not to do anything. It seems like what we're going to do. Uh, heard a lot of talk, a lot of rhetoric about SB2 and the limitations on cities and counties because they're the problem. I'm not here to advocate. I don't care what your position is. I don't really have a position. I'm just sharing information. Today in the paper you read it, Chairman Vaughn and Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which is the Chief Tax Policy Writing Committee, no tax bill gets passed unless it originates in the House in this committee. Said if we can't get them to do what we want them to do, we'll just shut it down their throat. Usually, chairmans have a little more eloquence in how they approach problems. It appears that they're willing to even take this to a special session if necessary. So I just want you to keep in mind because Y'all live in a very important district. But for Speaker Strauss, this would be a real comedy show. And it's not that darn funny. They're talking about limiting two jurisdictions that contribute to the taxes that we all pay. The city is about 16%, the county, somewhere between 13 and 16%, depending on what part of the county you live in. But the truth of the matter is, the big elephant in the room is the 55% of our tax bill that is generally the school district. And I'm not opposed to school districts. We need free public school districts. But 
you have to understand, or you don't have to understand, I'm hoping you'll understand, a major part of the problem with public school finance in Texas, and the courts have said this, starting in San Antonio with Edgewood 30 some odd years ago, repeatedly, and the legislature, doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, none of them have dealt with it. The fact of the matter is, 55% of your tax bill is controlled by the state of Texas. The state of Texas's constitution prohibits the state from imposing a property tax. They don't impose it, they just control all the strings. And I'm gonna tell you very concisely how that happens. I'm required by law, and Tommy is, to appraise property at 100% of market value. What that really means is homeowners, because that doesn't apply to commercial property in Texas. It just doesn't. We start there, but I've got $23 billion in litigation right now, all commercial property. That's just last year. None of those properties are contending that we have over-assessed their property, like many of you will. They're saying that they're unequally appraised because they've taken a statute that was created 20 years ago, in 1997, for homeowners. So that people live on the same street with homes built by the same builder or remodeled by the same remodeler or essentially the same homes in the same central location should be valued equally. Instead, commercial interests are able to take this statute and compare the shops at La Cantera or the Quarry Market to Bandera Point or to the Forum Shopping Center, which is ridiculous. There are no AAA tenants in any of those shows, other than the, the two primary ones. And also, one of the ladies who was here earlier said she wanted to talk about hotels. A couple of years ago, we talked about the JW Marriott. That's how the JW Marriott keeps from ever having its property on at market value. It's just a fact. They're not saying we're over-appraising them. They're saying that we're unequally appraising them. And all that equity statute requires you to do, whether you're a homeowner or whether you're the JW Marriott, is compare yourself to a handful of properties, generally six to 10, of similar quality and type of property. So you go out and find six other hotels. Is there another hotel in San Antonio better than JW Marriott? No, there isn't. So you take the number one best property in San Antonio, you compare it to a group, six or 10, of comparable hotels, you adjust them because they're not comparable. And in no way, the law provides, can the best hotel be appraised above the median level, which is the middle value between those six or 10, of all those properties. So you take the very best property, put it in the middle of the median, or the median of those comparables, you automatically have inequity <coughs> created by the equity statute. And that is because you've now placed properties that should have been appraised below the JW Marriott, above the JW Marriott. And guess what they're going to do next? They're going to compare themselves to the JW Marriott and say, make me less than that, because I should be. And so the median just spirals down. You can't change enough residential value to make up for one JW Marriott. You just can't. And so I've instructed my staff, we have a job to do in terms of arriving at market value, but I believe that the real inequity in this system is the shell game that the state plays with these numbers and what they tell you and what they charge me with doing. Uh, I don't like lying to people and I'm not going to, and I'm not gonna allow my staff to. Tommy's gonna talk about the appeal process. He's gonna talk about getting our evidence packet. That evidence packet is so critical to you. I'm sure most of y'all have already done that. Uh, but it ties our hands in terms of what we can produce at the review board if we're not able to settle. And by the way, 80% of the population settles with my staff, whether you do it online or whether you come into the office. If you um, get that evidence packet, it will give you the equity that we show your property and where it is in relation to all of the properties in your neighborhood. It will also give you all of the market data. Ironically, some eight or ten years ago, maybe four or five sessions ago, I could give you sales information if I had it. All you had to do is ask for it. The legislature has forced us not to give you that information in these days of open government, unless your property is under protest, and then I can give it to you. So, not our policy, that's just the statute. Um, 
back to that 55%. The legislative budget board, right before every session, tells the legislature what you can realistically expect to spend based on the controller's estimate of revenue for the next biennium. Probably all know that. The other thing the LBB told the legislature is, if you go to the controller's website, government, I believe, you can find the 10-year history, and I think it goes back several decades, of what public school finance and the state's share of that public school finance has been. I'm only going to go back 10 years. 10 years ago, the state funded to the tune of 60%, which meant we paid collectively 40%. Today, it's been turned on its head. 55% <coughs> us, 45% the state. Now, where that gets compounded for you guys and for all homeowners is, if you're not getting the same level of value treatment as that commercial property is, and I assure you, you are not, then you're being impacted disparately. I've asked the Bear County's Commissioner's Court to sue me in a friendly lawsuit so that I can give them the appropriate questions to get out there in the public so that people can see what this process is doing to them. They bought. <laughs> I thought I had them ready to go. I contacted Senator Corona, who happens to own, or I don't think he owns it, I think he manages or maybe is a partial owner of the largest homeowners association in the state, which is Associa. That's my homeowners association in the park at Deerfield. I said, would you consider suing me in a class action suit on behalf of any of your associations? I'll tell you how to do this. I had a three-month conversation with his general counsel, and they quit on me. So nobody's going to pick up this torch and fight for you. And every time I do, uh, I get a little closer to retirement. <laughs> uh, they don't take it very well. They don't like people being told the truth. Nobody knows more about what's happening to your property taxes than we do. And while I can empathize with you, if 10 of you guys would complain to the legislature in person, in email, let Jess Strauss know, let your Senators now, because we have senators that just gone nuts. Usually it's the House that's nuts, and the Senate is a little more decorum oriented. It's complete flip flop. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, you guys, 10 of you people, would be, 10 just general people, would be much more important to legislators than 10 bureaucrats. They don't care what I say. I'm paid to get values out there. That's what they say even though they have laws that make it against the law for me to be compensated based on your level of value. Um, but that's too much truth. I don't want to take up all your time tonight. I know you all want to get home and watch a basketball game. I'm going to let Tommy take over on his values in general. I know we had some specific questions, and we'll stay here and answer them as long as it takes. And I'm going to stick around up here in case Tommy has something he can't deal with, although I'm sure since he'll probably be one of the guys to replace me, he can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean for homeowners? Uh, good evening, guys. My name is Tom Allison. I'm the manager of the residential department. <coughs> I've been in the residential department now for 14 years. I've seen the market uh, in its early stages in the early 2000s run up to the housing level. I've seen it burst. I've seen it flatline. And now I've seen it come back. So I do want to talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, I'm the numbers guy. I spend most of my time reviewing the numbers and, and uh, trying to get that market level out there. Um, so if y'all receive an appraisal notice, it's it's my fault. So you, you can put a face to it. So how many people did receive an appraisal notice this year? Yeah, about nine out of 10 homeowners received an appraisal notice this year. I'm gonna go over why. Uh, but to gauge the audience here, uh, is everyone here from Mankey Park? Do I have any Westport? Uh, do I have any River Road? Because I know it's, it's all very similar. What's impacting the Mankey Park is impacting River Roads and impacting Westport. Um, you're in this, this uh, urban core now that is really going through a revitalization phase. Um, every neighborhood goes through a life cycle. Uh, and I remember many years Mankey Park was in, in, a, in a decline, it was flatlining. Uh, but then all of a sudden, all of this redevelopment came in. All of this uh, added interest. Uh, not to mention the traffic just keeps building. We keep adding, what, 20,000, 30,000 new 
uh, people to uh, San Antonio area every year or so? I think a month, maybe a month. Maybe a month. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have just a lot of different economic um, <coughs> activities going on and it's leading to this rise in property values. So I want to go over a little short history of that because we are now in our fifth year of expanded uh, real estate market where we see significant value growth. Um, in 2013, the Sabor San Antonio Board of Realtors reported that the San Antonio housing market closed out its biggest sales year since 2006. That was in 2013. Uh, the median and average Let's go over that. The average price back then was 184,000, and the median price was 100, around 150,000. Uh, 2014 comes along. San Antonio housing market grew in all areas in 2014. Uh, we increased our average price to 193, and our median price to 160. 2015 rolls around. Uh, the total number of homes sold in San Antonio area reached all-time highs in 2015. Our average price is now up to 208, and our median price is up to 170. 2016, these are the sales that will impact you on your 2017 appraisal. The momentum created by a record-breaking 2015 pushed sales figures up in 2016. The average price is now $218,000 and the median price is $180,000. Where can we expect this to go? Glad you asked, because they were reported on that. Uh, first quarter home sales 2017 show increase in the San Antonio area market. Our sales figures this year continue to outpace last year's. That's the first quarter. Uh, average price is right around $220,000, with a median price of $184,000. And uh, just this past month, San Antonio area home prices rise as summer nears, uh, increased demand and low inventory. And that's, that's the name of the game right now. The demand is far outpacing supply. We're not building enough houses to keep up. Uh, there's not enough new inventory coming out and the demand is just really outpacing supply, creating that upward pressure on values. Um, it's to the point right now where a well-positioned house will sell within hours of being put on the market, especially in highly desirable areas. That's just the market climate that we're in. Um, I just sat in on a, a Metro Study Economic webinar this week <coughs> saying that they expect this trend to continue well past 2018, 2019, they don't see really a correction or a moderate, a moderate uh, flattening of the market until about 2021. And they only expect it then because the inflated prices are starting to going to outpace the income. And we have seen increases in income. But those inflated prices are going to start putting uh, pressures on buyers and the affordability is going to go down. So they expect sometime around 2020, 2021 is to when we might expect to see a flattening of values in our market. Now that's, that's uh, not counting any type of outside activity, any national uh, event that might occur, any international event that may occur that could impact our, our economy. But San Antonio is very well positioned in terms of a diverse market, uh, population, climate, area, to, to weather a lot of that activity. And we can expect to see this value growth for not only this year, but continuing years. So what does that mean for you homeowners that received that appraisal notice? Uh, that appraisal notice comes with a notice of protest on the back. So your appraisal notice will tell you what we think your home is valued at this year. Um, you can take a look at that number. You can decide, <coughs> wow, what were they thinking? Or, well, that might not be too bad. Or, you know what, there's, I need to talk to them. There, there's something wrong with my account. Um, that is what that protest form is for, and that's what we're there for. We're there to uh, make sure that we get the record right. We have no interest in inflating values, or deflating values, or maintaining values. We're there to make sure that the values are correct. Uh, so as homeowners, uh, well, let me put this back. I have a staff of about 38 appraisers right now. 38 appraisers to value about 500,000 residential properties. Does that mean we can get to every property? No. Uh, that's why we have mass appraisal. So are we going to know the specifics of every property of every neighborhood? No, uh, but that's, that's the purpose of mass appraisal. That's why we're shooting at a median level of value. As a median level of value, everyone can expect an increase based on that median level. So as a homeowner, what I want to know is, is my information correct? Um, we're, we've started to be more restrictive on the data that we can provide you because of the legislature has uh, said what we can and cannot post on our website. So if you go to your account online and you find out 
why can't I see that? Well, there, there's something holding that back. So come to our office, find out what your record states, find out if our records are accurate on your property. The appraisal district was formed in, from the 1979 legislature and it did its first reappraisal in 1981. We had to gather all of our information from other entities at that time, uh, school districts, uh, counties, cities that had that information. So if your house was built before 1980, which may be part, there's a good chance that the characteristics might not be 100% accurate. So they're, they're, especially if it hasn't sold within the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so you want to make sure, first off, is your information correct? Second, by uh, filling out that protest, you can request our evidence packet. You can see the information that guided us in placing values for your neighborhood. And you can get that information. You can say, okay, why did you increase my, my value? Why did you increase the value of the neighborhood? Here's our evidence. This is what was indicating that values were going <coughs> value. Review that information. Compare that to your property. Um, if you're having, uh, if you want to know more information about it or how we interpret it or how we compare it to your property, come visit with us. We have an informal process for you to come into the office, speak with one of our appraisers and go over that type of data to see how we arrived at your value. Again, like Mike said, we resolve about 80% of any type of dispute at the informal level. Um, but then there is that 20% that we don't. Now, part of that 20%, people just don't come to the informal. They just skip the informal process and go straight to the ARB. That's their prerogative. The appraisal review board, they're there to um, weigh the evidence between the appraisal district and the homeowner and arrive at a value. Now, they set the value and that is a final value at that point. Uh, you still have options beyond that. If you feel that the appraisal review board reviewed the information and they still didn't give you a fair shake and you feel that the value still needs reconsideration, you have more options there too. You have binding arbitration. It does come with a filing fee with comptroller. It's $450 for homeowners now. For most. For most homeowners. Uh, once it gets above a million dollars, then we're looking at a little bit more, but for most homeowners, it's about $450. Um, it's very similar to your appraisal review board process. You meet uh, in front of an arbitrator, uh, who could be a real estate agent, who could be an attorney, who could be an arbitrator. Uh, and like the ARB, you present your evidence to this arbitrator. The appraisal district uh, presents our evidence to the arbitrator, and the arbitrator decides on value. Now that's binding, and then that's kind of like the end of the road. Um, other options for you, or you could file in district court. Now that's not a real reliable way for regular property owners because the fees associated with that filing fees, the attorney fees, the time spent, the hours, it starts to become a cost-benefit ratio that does not, it's not in favor of the homeowner. Uh, so that's where the binding arbitration process fills that gap. Uh, so there are options for you to protest. Um, I could go on, I've got a lot of data, but I do want to open it up for questions because I know a lot of y'all are going to have questions at this point. So what can, what can I help you along with in, in terms of value? I just, <coughs> I've got my appraisal. Mm -hmm. Taxes went up 8000 Okay, I can live with that, mm -hmm. sort of. Okay. But when you look at the particulars, my actual structure value mm -hmm. went down $40,000, yet my land value doubled, mm -hmm. and what I'm paying taxes on went up $32,000. Mm -hmm. So in reality, my taxes didn't go up 8000 they went up $32,000. How does the prop my house drop? That's the only question I have. Sure. There's a reason for that, yes. which will not make sense. <laughs> it won't make sense, but I, I can't accept it. But uh, that's, that, I just, it doesn't make sense. There are components to the overall value. Now, what we're interested in is the total market value. Do you feel like that total market value represents the value on your property? Yes or no? If not, please come in, let's discuss it, let's look at the evidence and try to arrive at a fair total market value. Now the components, yes, there is an improvement component and a land component. Uh, we are required by law to separate out the two, the improvements and the land. If you sell a property, most likely, 99% of the time, you're not going to sell the house without the land, or the land without the house. It's going to go together as a whole. Now, um, just a brief explanation, on the improvement side, we're a lot like your homeowner's insurance. We develop a replacement cost on your improvements. 
and then we depreciate it based on the age of the house and the condition of the house. We have that set value. Then we have a land value. When we add those two together, that gives us a total value. We compare that total value to what they're selling for. So if your replacement cost uh, uh, on your house is somewhere around 150000 and we depreciate it 50000 because it's 70, 80 years old, so we're looking at an improvement value of 100000 then we have $50,000 on the lot, we add those two together, we have $150,000. Okay, we compare that to what they're selling for. They're selling for $225,000, $250,000. How do we bridge that gap between our cost and land to what they're selling for? That is the market adjustment. And over time, we add that market adjustment to those components to increase the value. But at a certain point, those components, they, get, uh, they have to be redistributed because they get out of balance. Either the improvements get uh, out of balance, they're too high, or the land at some times can get out of balance because it's too low. We have to rebalance those components to make sure that they are, are fair and reasonable to the overall market value. The last time we made a major um, rebalance of the components effort was back in between 2006 and 2008, right, right there at the peak of the bubble, right before it bust, because values have inflated so much to that point that some of the components got out of balance. And then we went through the decline, we went through the flat market, and so there for a while, a few years, there wasn't much to do. Um, but now we're in our fifth, it's, it's our eighth year in expanded market activity, but it's our fifth year in, in significant value. Those components became out of balance. We had to redistribute those components. So that's why a lot of y'all will see a, a increase in your land values and, and a redistribution of your improvement value. And unfortunately, <coughs> being a disabled retired veteran mm -hmm. and a, uh, what's the other one? The <laughs> homestead. Homestead. And all of that has nothing to do with my property. It's just the value of my house, correct? Your exemptions do uh, reduce your taxable amount. So you do get the benefit from your homestead and your disabled veteran. But that, the market value will fluctuate as market value uh, changes within the market. Your assessed value, what you pay taxes on, will include those exemption amounts, and that, that's what you will want to be uh, looking at. So my assessed amount, I need to see all this. Because if, you're, if what you're saying, then there's, it's, because again, my taxes went up $8,000, mm -hmm. total taxes, <coughs> yet the amount that is, I have to pay on mm -hmm. from 2016 or 2016 till now, went up $32,000. So how can I go from here, $8,000, and now I'm paying $32,000 $32, more overall? So I was assuming, just based off of it, it was because the land value, my house decreased, yet my land value skyrocketed, and my exemptions did not cover that change. Your exemptions will cover that change. If they were in place in the prior year, and you carried it over, and you may know who approved okay. this to your property. Cool. They, they and, carry and the offerings, your, your assessed value, like your appraised market value, is always the combination of those two. The law requires what the law requires. We never get sales that say, oh, 132 mulberry sold for 80000 for the lot and 180000 for the house. You know, the whole property sold for 240 Right. Whatever it's sold right. for. The law on the trail has always required a present district to separate the land from the approved sure. Trail. The sum total of those two must still equal market value. Just because we came up with some theory about what the redistribution or the reallocation of those two components should be, but that doesn't absolve us or resolve the fact that the total still must equal market value. That's why you want our evidence back. And then we'll talk about your exemptions, because any exemptions you have are not affected by the value. Your value is affected by the exemption, and actually your taxes are affected by the exemption. Okay. So I refinanced my house in November and I had an appraisal. Yes. Um, November wasn't very long ago. Mm -hmm. um, in May, lo and behold, when I get my valuation, it's about 30% um, more than it was in November. That's good information to bring in for us to examine, yes. Uh, it's a very valid, yes. Uh, <laughs> Couple things, guys. Remember, the protest deadline is May 31st. Yes. 
the evaluation day as a matter of law, not a policy, is January 1 every year. Now, the state controller's <coughs> office, when they study our level of value, which this goes back to the funding formula and the purse strings, if you will, they want to make sure that we have you guys, I'm talking about you guys collectively, as us homeowners, at as close to 100% of value as possible. And this determines how much state aid your school district receives if you're in a Chapter 42 school district like most, or if you're in a Chapter 41 school district, how much you will or you won't repay and recapture. Now, here again, the state tests us every two years. By law, I have to dump all of my data, although it takes me about 10 times because they don't have a computer system that will take all of my data. But I have to give them about 10 zip files of all of their accounting. It's um, three or four terabytes of data. The problem is, once they have all this data, then they do this juggling act of whether or not we've met the criteria within this school district and that school district, and then they apply things like Back when we had a lot of foreclosures, if, if foreclosures affected value in a school district, if there was more than 20% foreclosures in the school district, I think is their standard, then we had to consider foreclosures. But we don't have foreclosures virtually anymore. And so, in some cases, we were able to use our own laws against them to help us get our school districts back into the local funding <laughs> formula. Because if you don't, then they either withhold money from your poor school district, or they soak your school district if you're a paying school district for more money. So there's a lot of pressure for us to get that value as close to 100% as possible. Mathematically, the number is 95 to 105. That leaves 10%, at least 5% of the population can expect to be able to assessed. And so those are the folks we need to talk to and make sure that we get those properties brought back into the fold. Uh, the ones that are below, you know, Good for you. <laughs> if you have a current appraisal, that's helpful. We want to look at that with you. Uh, the data set that you need to look at and be concerned with is generally six months before the appraisal date and six months after the appraisal date. That's the 12-month window that the state looks at. If we have an escalating market, we can time adjust the June sale back to January 1 because we know what the growth rate is per month. It's published by the Texas and Real Estate Center. That's the number we rely on. If you sold six months earlier than the first year, we can kind of adjust that sale forward because that's a published number. It's not a made up number, it's a known number. And so that's something that we can share with you. Uh, those are third party figures, it's not a <coughs> figures. Uh, there's a lot of ways we can get around to trying to work these things out with you guys. That's all I'm saying. It's just math. Um, we're, we're in San Antonio ISD. Does San Antonio, have, has San Antonio ISD ever challenged the comptroller evaluation study? I just did in 2014 because out of 12 school districts, the state controller failed me in 10 mm -hmm. out of the 12 school districts while telling me I passed in Alamo Heights. So <laughs> I knew that was BS. Uh, but I did, uh, I, I happen to know Comptroller Hager very well personally. Uh, both when he was a senator and when he was a house member and when he was just a lawyer in the rice farm. But uh, he's probably the last statewide elected respectable politician that I know. I knew I could call him if I had to. Instead, we sat in a room about this size and we filled up the paper about halfway up these walls because the state requires everything come to them in paper. Uh, in triplicate, no less. And I did that for 10 school districts. And it took me 10 months of fighting them. But we did challenge, and we did win. I've never not beaten the state. Yes, can you go over in very general fashion how market value is determined in any given location? Sure. In sure. Uh, given a neighborhood, neighborhood has boundaries. Uh, it is a general location. Park, you know your boundaries. We collect sales information within those boundaries. Uh, sales prices will range. You'll have a low and you'll have a high and you'll have everything in between. Uh, we're looking at all those sales. We're comparing those sales to what our values are and we're shooting for a middle value. We're looking at a median ratio of appraisal. So if the median value for Maiden Park 
goes from 200 to 224. <coughs> Essentially, that's what we're trying to aim for. Uh, but that goes for any neighborhood. We're collecting sales within any, within any neighborhood boundary and, and evaluating that to the values on our properties. So that right, includes both commercial and residential? Just residential. Just and residential? We're just residential. And we can even narrow it down because I know y'all are seeing a lot of uh, a new construction activity in your neighborhoods. You're getting, you're getting townhomes, you're getting new houses, things like that. We can, we can uh, separate that out to where we're just looking at the older properties built in the 1930s and 40s, or we're looking at the new townhomes, or we're looking at a new constructed uh, uh, house. We, we can isolate all of that to try to find a, the best comparable for that group of properties. Oh, so a residential property would always be compared to other residential properties out there? All that family is also pretty heavily uh, in, in the southern section of Mankey Park. We realize that, so we separate out the multifamily from the residential as well. Thank you. Have a question. Um, if we have received uh, an evaluation, or mm -hmm. the, 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 so mm -hmm. what, I mean, Go with mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Everybody can value went out more than a thousand dollars shouldn't have got it, should have gotten a notice. Or if you had an exemption last year that you don't have this year, by law I have to give you a notice. So if you haven't received one, the best thing to do is contact our office. Mm -hmm. Or you can look online. Actually now they can can they print their notice online? I know we can track their ARD and their informal schedule you know, online. Not, not I don't think we can do notices yet. Right. But one more thing on it. Yes, you can print out your value. You can actually, remember folks, one thing we haven't said, whether you get a notice, whether you don't get a notice this year, next year, or any year, you can always protest your value, whether the value went up, whether the value went down, whether the value stayed the same. The state of Texas doesn't care. You can protest on that form, you can protest on the napkin. I don't care. As long as I can identify your signature, identify the property, and identify the reason for your protesting. It's too high. I live at 132 Mulberry. Here's my signature. Here's my date. It's in an envelope and I received it. And there's a date stamp. Give me my hearing. I have that long. So, you go online to get the protest forms? The protest forms are available online. And uh, one thing we haven't said, and I promise I'll answer your question. One thing we haven't said is we start our informal schedule on May 25th. So, anytime between now and then, that is the 24th. You can come to our office from 8 to 5, fill out your protest, request the evidence packet, take it home, review it, or sit in our office. We have a nice area where you can sit at a desk and, and look it over if you're comfortable with that. If you need more time but you want to come back next week before the 24th and have an informal, you can get that done and be done with it. Uh, that's totally up to you. That and electronic protest. We now have the option of electronic protest through the informal process. You can go online, fill out a protest online, have an informal hearing online, um, and in most cases resolve that way as well. He's got so it's in, in on file by the format of the form that's on online? I'm sorry? You're not filed by that format? So I mean with the uh, online. I already looked at the uh, form online, uh -huh. and I'm, I'm just asking if you're not actually bound by the format. For uh, which? The protest, the, the, protest. the protest form? Yeah. Uh, not for the form. No. Not, not for the form itself, but for the online protest, we have to have a signature. And oh. so you have to file your protest, whether it's generally through snail mail or drop it off or whatever. When you get your appraisal notice from us, you're going to have a PIN number on your appraisal notice in the vicinity of your legal, if I'm not mistaken, on the upper right hand corner. That PIN number enables you to log into our website, uh, which also has a kind of a tutorial on how to use that protest form, how to use that protest, electronic protest, where you can share and receive data from us, and then we can make offers to you if there's an offer to be made. Uh, a lady friend of mine at the gym this morning said, well, I got online and I did this and I did that, and all they offered me was no change, and I said, because I told you, there's no reason to change your value. They just pay you 300000 and send them out for two eighty nine. dollars um, That's not a really good argument. So, people do overpay for property. <laughs> that could be a possibility. We need to look at the other sales and see what everybody's doing. Just because you have a, you know, we, we try to throw out outliers both on the high side and the low side. <coughs> so 
we, we don't have a dog in this fight in terms of trying to get the highest value. I just need my school districts to look as poor as possible within the tolerance level statistically that the state is giving me. That assures the maximum amount of state aid with the least amount of money out of your pocket. Or if you're now on Heights or Northeast ISD and you're sending recapture money back, you send back the least amount of money, the most amount of money stays in Bear County, and the state can go do whatever the whole state does. Yes, sir. But we can bar that went from 36000 to 90000 that's not the worst case I've seen. No? For no. Mankey Park? Pardon? For Mankey Park, just a vacant lot is $90,000 in Mankey Park, no? You know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to tell you we have 10 vacant lot sales in Mankey Park. The, the problem is, is we're still looking at a composite value, the total value. If, you know, we do have size adjustment factors because they're different size lots <coughs> in every neighborhood. That may be one that we need to look at, you know. Uh, I had this discussion with the folks in Northwood uh, last week, week before last week, whatever, seemed like yesterday. Because <laughs> we do about two or three of these a week. But uh, they were really upset because they had a big reshuffling of their land value. We've had three land sales in there. So each one of them in every category, a quarter acre, a half acre, and nearly an acre, was around thirty to 40000 more than when it raised the values to. That also is not necessarily the best indication of value. Uh, in my neighborhood, there's only three vacant lots left out of 250 lot neighborhood. So whoever wants to live in there is going to pay a premium for those lots. And we recognize that. That's why we didn't hit that number. But there still is a discernible <coughs> percentage. And generally it's 25 to 30 percent land value to, to a total value. And so you know, usually you can look at a 75, 25 split between the improvements and the land value. Sometimes that number doesn't fit so well, particularly in older neighborhoods, because there's less reliable vacant land data. I can't just compare it to the next development. But generally, that's what we're shooting for. Mm -hmm. Protest your value. Come in, see us, get our data. And I just thought you could imagine homes up on Claremont and weekly, they'll get land. And it's part of the driver. It's part of the driver. You go from $600 to $20 by $100. Ouch. Okay, any other questions? We're going to have to wrap up this quarter. I have a question. So when you guys are determining the median value, how far back are you going? Like, as far as sales prices, are they like the most previous three years, six months, a year? The closer to the first, the better. But generally, we look at six months either side of the first, because that's what the state looks at. So we want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples when they come and look at our numbers. And with the market the way it's been going, it's we've had to keep up with that. Okay. Could you take a moment, I think all of the questions specifically about um, land values, property values that they have Could you take a moment to talk about what's happening with the Lowe's dark store? Lowe's. Home centers nationally in about 2008 when Michigan started depopulating, um, they had a lot of big box stores that went dark or empty, if you will. You know, at uh, 410 and 281, the target sat there empty for a long time. It's recently been redeveloped, yada, yada, yada. That's what they're talking about. Lowe's thinks that their $110, $120 square foot store should be valued at 20 bucks a foot in Bear County, irrespective of where they are. There are income approaches to valuing those types of commercial properties. There's a direct sales comparison approach to valuing those kinds of properties. And there's a cost approach that you can use to value those kinds of properties. The land value at uh, Blanco and 281, near where I live, I know is going to be relatively high for that Lowe's. I also know that when they compare it to the one on Southeast Military, that's going to be not as high. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, each of those levels ranges from 135 to 137,000 square feet. In their own home state of North Carolina, where Lowe's is based out of, they tried this story and they lost. The Supreme Court poured them out and put them on at 110 bucks a foot. They sued me here in Bear County, alleging 20 bucks a foot. They sued Harris County, they sued Travis County, they sued Williamson County, they sued Lubbock County, they sued Dallas County. All those guys settled. Uh, they settled with numbers that were much higher than what they offered me. I don't know why they thought Bear County was a good crash test dummy, but 
I've been at this for 22 years as a chief and 36 years as a human, and I know BS when I see it. Um, fortunately, the arbitration panel consisted of Judge Peoples, Judge Payton, and George Brin, a local arbitrator and mediator, all picked by opposing counsel. Hallelujah. Uh, we spent a week at trial with these guys. I spent $300,000. At one time, I had $1,600 an hour just in attorneys on my side of the table. They brought in the experts from Michigan that had been successful in nine other states in getting their values slashed in half to 75% off of what they were previously assessed at. The problem with Texas is we don't, other states don't have an equal and uniform appeal system like Texas does. So you only need one Lowe's to go down. Once that Lowe's is devalued, every other big box can be too off of it. But it's what that does to you. You don't get that treatment. And so we fought it wrong, we fought it hard, my board made up its mind, I visited with every taxing jurisdiction, every school district. I told them all, I know you all are all used to getting money back from me at the end of the year because by law I can't keep what I don't spend, and we don't spend it just because we have it. I will be encumbering funds from now until the cows come home because even though I prevailed at the non-binding arbitration, which essentially cost me the same thing as a week-long trial, they now are pursuing or trying to reinstate equity. Uh, tomorrow morning I'm meeting with my attorneys and uh, I also hired um, Wallace Jefferson's brother. <laughs> I can't remember his name for the lack of name at the moment. To co-counsel with us. Uh, because he is a very competent trial lawyer and he's also very well known in this community and I thought it was important that we have not only a competent appraisal representation but competent community representation because it's a community at stake. My pay doesn't change, the district doesn't change, but what happens to the community changes dramatically if this happens. I'll wrap this up. I had a member of the House, the chairman, who was willing, or actually a member of the Ways and Means Committee, the Chairman Bonner had asked, because Controller Paper asked that a bill be drafted. I drafted a very simple bill. Um, it was only a paragraph long. The business community came unglued. Uh, essentially, the guy that was carrying the bill for us got hired by a tax consultant slash tax attorney group, and the bill's dead. So now, the rest of the state of Texas, and Possibly the school finance system in Texas now rests on how well we do a trial next March. It was expected that if I lost this trial, it would cost San Antonio schools about $850 million over the biennium, over a two-year period, assuming that it, closed, it wouldn't stop the lows, and then move to the apartment complexes and retail and offices and Lowe's are institutional properties. They're bought and sold by real estate investment trusts. They don't own just Lowe's. They own every category of property on the planet other than residential. So the possible impact to the state, the controller informed me. I met the controller Hager back in September. I went to arbitration in October. He said that Bear County schools make up 10% of the wealth in the state of Texas. So an $8.5 million loss in Bear County for the biennium was an 8 and a half billion dollar loss to the state of Texas because the state of Texas has to hold school districts harmless when we lose a trial. But there's only one trial. So I only lose a few hundred million dollar loads. The other ones are just everyday appeals. And I can't afford to go to trial with everybody. At one point I looked at my, my docket and if I just stopped paying everybody that works for me and I didn't pay the water and light and I didn't pay anybody anything. I have about $10,000 per case I have to spend. That'll get me Lamont Jefferson for about four days. If he doesn't go to lunch and he doesn't charge me for breaks. And that's just the way it is. It went very well, but I think now we're on a different chapter. So, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, so I still can't shop at lunch. <laughs> I know.